Shalom lekulam. Welcome everybody to this new IVS initiative, Crucial Skills for Scientists. After the success we had with the big topics from top scientists, where we had really amazing, amazing scientists, uh, top notch, presenting their uh, in their research on very, very uh, different topics. Now we are launching a new initiative, Crucial Skills for Scientists. The goal here is to learn some skills that we believe are fundamental for all of us that are involved in research, uh, being PhD, postdoc, student, masters, professors. Uh, there are some skills that are key, crucial. For example, how to write a scientific paper. Uh, this is a, a absolutely vital skill if you want to succeed, succeed in the academic uh, research world. And here we have a top teacher for this, Professor Ray Boxman. Uh, I know him personally. We worked very closely on the last IVS conference. And on top of that, I got feedback from people who were his students on this uh, type of workshop. And they told me wonders about it. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I'm sure you're going to learn. And we have other topics lined up. And we would like to hear from you if you have specific topics that you think should be added to this uh, new series. So welcome everybody. And I wish you to really enjoy this presentation. And I wish Ray to, like my advisor, PhD advisor used to say, razzle, dazzle and impress. And let's all learn together. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's start that share. And uh, while uh, Ray is putting up his presentation to share with us, I'll just give him a brief introduction. Um, as Daniel said, Ray is a really great choice to kick off this new series. Uh, Ray has been involved with the AVS for over two decades when as head of the plasma, he first brought that group into the IVS as a division. And I still recall his really great attention to student poster presentations, suggesting guidelines for, for the proper poster composition and the presentation. And in fact, Ray has dedicated himself to this critical part of scientific development. He taught a technical writing course for PhD students at Tel Aviv University for 16 years. And over the years, he developed that passion into a sidelight of his work and is now a sought after speaker on science on scientific communication. He gives courses all around the world on this topic, and he's published an accompanying book uh, on that together with his wife. Uh, so Ray is an emeritus professor at Tel Aviv University, where he established the plasma laboratory back in the mid-1970s. He specialized there in arc plasma for materials processing and carried out really innovative work throughout his entire career, which resulted in a number of patents and multiple publications. And from this work, he got a lot of accolades. He has a number of awards, uh, uh, including uh, being named as a fellow of both the IEEE and the International Microwave Power Institute. So uh, having said that, um, I'll let uh, Ray take it from here. We're really looking forward to learning something about scientific communication now. And I'd like to remind everyone that this is the um, first of two talks that Ray is giving on this. This is a two-part uh, session. The next one will be given uh, next week. So please, Ray. Okay, thank you very much, uh, both to Daniel and to Sydney for the introduction. First of all, can everyone see my screen and can everyone hear me? Great, okay, thank you very much. Here's the problem. We, and by we, I mean I, you, the whole community spend a good deal of our time writing what are called research reports. And in contrast to uh, other tasks that we may have to do, typically we don't have training for it. If you're an electrical engineer and you have to use an oscilloscope, someone will teach you how to use an oscilloscope. If you are, God forbid, a material scientist and you have to use a scanning electron microscope, no one will even let you come into the same room until you've gone through some kind of indoctrination and passed some kind of test. But um, for many of us, we have not been fortunate enough to have been trained in how to write a research report. 
no, I can't do this in an hour and a half uh, that uh, I'll have a net uh, to do so between uh, today's webinar and next week. But what I do wanna do is to give you some highlights uh, that will help you get started. It's not a substitute for a um, full semester course. And I know there are such full semester courses at Tel Aviv, at the Weizmann Institute, uh, at the Technion, and even at Ariel. Uh, if you have an opportunity to take a full semester course, I urge you to do so. And if your university doesn't have a full semester course, tell them to contact me. So what I wanna do is to give you a recipe for preparing good research papers. Now, uh, I say a recipe, uh, we all live here in Israel and we know that, for example, there are hundreds of recipes for how to cook eggplant. Uh, Ray, can I interrupt for just a minute? Someone sent a message that they don't see your slides. I'm wondering, I see them. I'm wondering if anyone else who has that problem, can they uh, put up a, a hand or something? Okay. Most people, everyone's saying they see. Okay. Okay. If so, someone so, is so, not seeing it, it's probably because you've chosen the wrong options on, uh, on your screen. Yeah, check your options, please, because it sounds like it's not a problem with the broadcast. Yeah, okay. if, you, if you're if you using two screens, uh, you, you have to make sure that they're both visible. One will probably have uh, my talking head and the other will have the slides. Okay, so I wanna give you a good recipe for how to write a paper, but I want to stress that just like there are many recipes for eggplant, there are many recipes for writing a good paper as well. Now, the good thing about my recipe is that it comes with a money back guarantee. If you do it my way, it'll always be a good paper. Now by good, I mean in terms of style and organization. The content clearly is up to you. I can't help with that. By good, I mean that it'll be acceptable to the major journals in your field be it the IEEE journals, the American Institute of Physics journals, the IOP journals, et cetera. But frankly, as far as I'm concerned, that's a low standard. The much more difficult standard and important standard is that the paper should be easy to read. Now that doesn't mean that it's easy to write. We have to work hard. So here's my plan. I want to give a short introduction and basically make an analogy between a research paper and a communications channel. That's because I started off my career basically being a radio engineer. I wanna talk about what you do before you begin to write. I wanna give a few tips about English composition. And then most of the talk will be centered on the research report. By research report, I mean a journal paper, a thesis, or an internal report in an institution or company. The research uh, paper typically has the following sections, introduction, method, results, discussion, conclusions, and uh, it begins with an abstract and a title. I'll talk about each of these sections individually and how they fit together. And then finally, I'll summarize and conclude with 10 commandments, that's what he wrote for how to write a good paper. Now, a journal paper is a communications channel, just like you have a communications channel when you pick up your uh, cell phone and call your girlfriend or boyfriend. The objective of the scientific paper is to use this channel to convey information as efficiently as possible. Now, there are all kinds of communication tra channels. For example, when you use your cell phone, you have a point-to-point -point communications channel. You talk with one other person as a rule, and they talk back to you, and it has certain advantages. For example, you can provide feedback. If uh, David uh, says something to me and I don't hear him well, I can say, Dudu, say it again, okay? On the other hand, there's another kind of broadcast channel called broadcast. Okay, in broadcast, you have one transmitter. Call Yisrael, okay? 
and many, many receivers, maybe even millions of them. Now in our point-to-point -point communication system, everyone who has a phone like this, they're pretty much equivalent. They look about the same, they have about the same dimensions, approximately the same cost, maybe between 100 and and $1,000, all from the same order of magnitude. On the other hand, in a broadcast channel, the transmitter might cost a million dollars. If it's a direct satellite broadcast transmitter, probably a hundred million dollars. Whereas the receivers might be cheap, a hundred dollars or thereabouts. We put a lot more effort into the transmitter than we do to the receiver. In other words, your job as the transmitter is very important, very crucial, and cost a lot of money in order that the reader's job will be easy. Just like in, let's say, radio communication, where the transmitter and the receiver have to be on the same wavelength and use the same protocol, AM, FM, whatever, okay? Likewise, we as writers have to be on the same wavelength and use the same protocol as what our readers expect. If we do, the results are usually good. And if we don't, they're usually not so good. This means that we have to know the proper protocol for writing a paper. Now, with a radio or a television transmitter, there are usually international and national standards. Uh, and this sets the protocol. Not so with a paper. There's no document that says, if you haven't written the paper exactly like this, uh, you're violating the law or something like that. It doesn't work like that. Nonetheless, there is a protocol fixed by convention. A convention, what I mean is, this is what everybody does. If we do it the same way, the chances are it'll be good. If we try to be original and do something unusual, it's a recipe for disaster. Now, we have to remember what we are writing. We're writing a scientific paper. Not a murder mystery. The reader wants information, not your personal history and how you arrived at those results. Time sequences are relevant only to the extent that it affects the result. The organization, the sequence of presentation is optimized to convey information to the reader efficiently, not to make a good story. When you write a murder mystery, you only reveal who did it on the last page. We don't have that constraint. We uncover information in the sequence that the reader can most easily absorb the information. Now, the key to writing a good paper is to have, for that matter, for doing good research, is to have a well-defined research question before you begin. Every good research paper revolves around a well-defined research question. Now, there might be more than one. There might be two, maybe three, okay? But that's it. If it's already four, five, six, or a dozen, it will not be a good paper. And very likely, it won't be good research either. Here's an example of a well-defined research question. How does bias voltage affect the adhesion and interface structure of titanium aluminum nitride coatings applied to stainless steel substrates. Very specific. It ends with a question mark and it demands an answer. Now in some fields like biology and medicine, the research question is actually stated formally in the paper and it's called the hypothesis. Usually in our field, not so. It's not explicit. However, it should be implicit in what I will call phase four of the introduction, which we'll get to in a few minutes. And most important, it must be answered explicitly in the conclusions of your paper. Now, a couple of ethical issues. First and foremost is scientific integrity. When you report a result, 
that means you really got that result. You did all the things that you said you did, and that's what you got. No futzing around or burying stuff. That means that if you've had outliers, if you have results which don't conform to your theory, you still report them. You can explain away why some uh, results you're going to take into account and others you are not. Like maybe, uh, I don't know, a bird flew through your experiment at just that moment. But you don't just not report them. Second issue is plagiarism. Plagiarism is passing off as your work, either the ideas or words or data or pictures of somebody else. Everything in your report must be yours unless you explicitly indicate by using a reference that it is not. That means you don't cut and paste anything from the web. Now, it pains me to say this because I figured that, you know, graduate students should all know this very well, but I've discovered that they don't. So if this is the first time you've heard it, remember you've heard it, okay? And I hope that you, you know this anyway. Nonetheless, I'm mentioning it. And lastly, no double publication. When you publish something, you only publish it once. Now, we can debate about what is a publication. Uh, for example, a conference proceeding may or may not be a publication. It depends. But what you don't do is uh, take the same paper and submit it to two journals at the same time only to one journal at one time. If one rejects it, you can submit it to the other and you don't even have to tell the other that it was rejected, but only one at a time. And once you've published it, that's it. You don't publish it again. Okay, a couple of, a couple of comments about composition, particularly English composition, though most of the rules I will state uh, apply to all languages. Scientific writing is always hierarchical. It has a top-down organization. We divide the work into chapters or sections, into subsections, maybe even sub-subsections, and into paragraphs and sentences. Before you begin to write, you should write a detailed outline down to the level of one line on the outline, giving the topic of every paragraph. And this is because that a major problem in bad writing is misplaced statements. If you just write things down in the order that they come into your mind, then you may find that you forgot to include some detail of how you got your result in your methodology section, and you throw it out in the results section. Or you get to the discussion and you realize that you forgot to give a result, so you give it in the discussion. If you make a detailed outline, you're less likely to do this. Now from the bottom up, remember that a sentence expresses a complete thought. It has to have a verb and a subject. Now in English, there's a natural word order. We give the subject first, the verb second, and then everything else, which is called the predicate afterwards, usually. You can vary this order, but there should be a good reason to vary the order. This is the default order, and it should be used, let's say, 75% of the time. Here's some examples. This, rela this relation is valid when X is greater than R. This relation is the subject, is, is the verb and everything else is the predicate. The chamber, that's the subject, was evacuated, is the verb, and then everything else with a diffusion pump. Hey, that's even appropriate for the vacuum society. One of the things that uh, almost everybody can do to improve their writing, particularly in English, is to use strong natural verbs wherever you can, rather than a derived noun plus a weak generalized verb. Here's an example of what not to do. Anything in red, by the way, in my slides, means stop, 
don't do it. If it's green, that's what you should do. For example, measurements were made of the coating hardness using a nano indenter. Measurements is a noun derived from a very nice verb called measure. It would be much better to write this sentence. The coating hardness was measured using a nano indenter. It's shorter and it's stronger. I don't want you to ever make measurements or perform an analysis in the papers that you write. I want you to measure and analyze. Uh, another hint is to avoid starting sentences for a long prepositional phrase. For example, using a CSEM model 3400 nano indenter equipped with a flashlight and a microcomputer, <sighs> the hardness of the coating was measured. Okay, I ran out of breath before I even got to the subject. Better would it be to put the subject right up front. The hardness of the coating was measured using and then all that um, additional important information. Now in English, but not all languages, for example, in Hebrew, this is not nearly as important. The paragraph has a um, distinct structure and fulfills a function. Each paragraph is like a mini composition. The first sentence of the paragraph defines the topic. Now it's usually implicit, not explicit. We don't say the topic of this paragraph is uh, micro hardness, okay? But rather the sentence itself implicitly tells you what this paragraph is all about. The subsequent sentences develop this idea in some kind of logical order. And the final sentence presents the conclusion or main point, a okets. Here's an example. In the final stage, the net deposition rate on the anode is zero. Okay, here, starting with a prepositional phrase, we are stating basically the subject of this paragraph. Here we violated the law about uh, uh, putting the subject first. And that calls attention to this phrase and lets the reader know, for example, that uh, here we can find the subject of the paragraph. And then subsequent uh, sentences develop the, uh, the, the theme. Cathodic material is either deflected by a high pressure A plasma before it reaches the anode or is re-evaporated after a very short dwell time, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, in the last sentence, we give the main point. Um, a given location on the substrate may be exposed primarily to C plasma or A plasma according to the geometry of the electrodes and the shields and the plasma flow dynamics as illustrated schematically in figure three. I'm sure everyone is using a word processor these days. I'd like to just mention a few features about using a word processor that can help you a great deal and save you a lot of time. Uh, I mean, basically you can do the 80-20 rule definitely applies to word processes. You can use 20% of the features, maybe even 10%, to do 80 or 90% of the work that you need to do. But there are a couple of features in that 20% that are important for writing a scientific paper and can really save you time. So I want to kind of mention that. But before I mention that, the most important thing is frequently back up your work. You should save whatever you're writing at least once every 15 minutes. Most word processors have an automatic feature that does that, definitely use it. But in addition, at least once a day, back up your work on some media that's stored separately from your computer. Put it in the cloud, uh, put it on a, a disk on key, put it someplace that is stored separately in a different building if possible than your main computer. 
Boxman's first rule of computer science is that your hard drive will fail. The first uh, corollary to Boxman's first law is that it will fail two days before your deadline. So you must be prepared for this. Now about the word processor itself, learn to use styles. Styles are collections of formatting commands that you want to use under, you want to use the same commands for uh, the same purpose throughout your paper. For example, your main header, your sub uh, section header, your usual text, uh, captions, etc. Learn how to use them. Uh, you should indent and have an extra space before new paragraphs. Build it into the style. Learn how to use automatic endnote numbering. Um, Boxman's first law about reviewing papers. Your reviewer, be it your thesis advisor or an external reviewer, will always find some paper that you should have cited and you haven't. And the corollary to that law is that if you had 35 references, it'll never be where, where, where you were gonna put this new reference will be number 34. It'll always be in the first five. And it's a real pain in the butt to go through and renumber all the references and all the places where you've referenced the references. It's terrible. Learn how to do it automatically. Do not insert extra blank spaces or blank lines. It defeats the automatic features of word processors that make your text look nice. Learn how to use the tab key to control horizontal spacing. Learn how to use tables, not just for tables, but also for to, to organize uh, your text. Use insert line and page break if needed to make stuff uh, go to the next page. Okay, now let's get down to the main uh, topic of for today, which is the organization of the research paper. Um, the typical research paper will have an abstract that summarizes the work. It'll have an introduction that answers the question, what are we talking about here? It'll have a methodology section. It might be called in an experimental paper, experimental uh, apparatus and procedure or something like that. But it answers the question, what did we do? It'll have a results section that answers the question, what did we observe or what did we get? It'll have a discussion section that answers the question, so what? And finally, it'll have conclusions where you answer the research question and maybe give one or two other points that you want the readers to remember. Now, one way of looking at this organization is through this trapezoidal diagram, where the width here indicates how narrowly or widely focused this particular section is. The introduction begins rather broadly, and as you go through it, narrows down. The body of the paper, namely the methodology and results sections, are very narrowly focused. And the discussion begins narrow, but then broadens out. So let's begin at the beginning with the introduction. Um, the introduction has four compulsory parts, general background, literature review, gap, and objectives. And the vertical space here uh, indicates schematically the relative amount of volume taken up by these sections. Most of the introduction is basically the literature review. Uh, the general background is maybe one or two paragraphs. The gap and objective in a paper are probably a single sentence each. Now, the introduction and discussion are the hardest for the novice to write well. In contrast, uh, the methodology and results sections are much more straightforward. If you don't know how to get started in writing your paper, don't start with the introduction. Start with the results. It's a lot easier. Anyway, the objective of the introduction is to give the reader sufficient background information 
so that he or she can understand and appreciate your work. It basically puts your work into context and gives the reader a good starting point for understanding the details that you will present later. Besides these four required parts, there are two optional parts called value statements and a preview. Now let's look at these sections individually. The first part, the, inner, the general background, is to place the paper in very broad context and to bring the reader up to speed. Now, it should be understandable by every reader of your work. And that means you have to know who your readers are. If you're writing a paper, it depends upon the journal that you're going to publish it in. It's different if you're going to publish it in Nature, okay, or uh, uh, Review of Physics or something like that, which are rather broad, or you're going to publish it in a Journal of Left-Handed Screws, okay? It has to be broad enough that everyone who would be reading that journal can at least understand the first one or two paragraphs. It should define the, the overall topic, not the specific topic of your, uh, of, of your paper, but the overall topic. It should be short, usually one, maybe two paragraphs, three to five sentences in a journal paper. In a thesis, it might be between a half a page and two pages. And it's usually very general, non-controversial sentences. Its only purpose is to let the reader know, in general, what is, this, what is the overall topic of this paper. Next, we get to the literature review. If the general background gave the, uh, the overall general context, the literature review puts your paper into a specific context. It sets the stage for stating what was not done previously in the gap sentence and showing by showing what was done. Now, there are three ways to organize this literature review. I mean, basically what you're doing in a literature review is you're saying what other people have done before, okay? Bergman showed such and such. Uh, Grimberg showed something else. Evanstein showed yet another thing. So how do we organize it? There are three uh, methods and you can choose whatever is appropriate for your paper. One is by approach. Um, a bunch of guys uh, did experimental work, a bunch of, another bunch of guys did simulations and a third bunch did theoretical work. So you group in one paragraph, everyone who did theory, another paragraph, everyone who did simulations, etc. You want to end with the approach which is closest to yours. Another possibility is relevance. You start with the least relevant paper and you end with the paper that is closest to what you did. And the third approach is chronological. You start with Isaac Newton and you end with the paper that you just read last week. Now I have a pet peeve and that's, please don't use reference numbers as if they are words. If you have to say these numbers, rewrite the sentence. For example, examples of crack propagation in composite materials are given in one to four. If you have to say one to four in order for the sentence to complete, write it differently. For example, Crack propagation has been previously investigated. That's a complete sentence. Where was it previously investigated? Well, we have the numbers right here, but I didn't have to say them out loud. It's a good idea to cite work by the author's name and then give the number. People will remember, uh, for example, Bergman, even more so Boxman. Okay, they're not going to remember number 32. 32 gives them no information. If they want to know the context, they have to stop reading 
and go to the back of their paper, okay, and look at it and then go back. It breaks the whole cycle of um, absorbing information. On the other hand, if you say Boxman found or Testa found, um, they're likely to be familiar with the source and it'll mean something to them and they can remember it if you happen to mention it again. What about your own work? Clearly, if you've done relevant work, you're going to cite it in the literature review, but you should treat your own work fairly. If you have 30 references and 25 of them are from either your own work or work from your colleagues in your laboratory, um, well, I think that uh, all of your readers and especially your reviewers are gonna be suspicious, okay? They're gonna be suspicious of, uh, does this guy really know the field? And they're gonna be suspicious of you as an investigator if uh, this is all you can come up with in a literature review is your own work. Okay, after you've stated what was done, the next part called the gap is stating what was not done. What is the justification for presenting yet another paper? Usually, in fact, it'll be because something has not yet been done, but possibly you'll be presenting this paper because there was an error in the previous work. Well, if you're unfortunate enough to, to be in this situation, you want to be careful and tactful. Or there may be a dis disagreement or controversy between the various sources. Anyway, here is where you state what the justification for that work is. I'll concentrate on the first case, what was not done, because that's what usually happens. Though I claim this is the most important single sentence for getting your paper accepted. Why? Because a common cause, maybe even the most common cause for rejecting a paper is that the uh, reviewer doesn't think there's anything really new. A gap sentence by indicating exactly what was not done previously shows that your work is new. A good gap sentence will force the reviewer to work hard to reject your paper for lack of novelty. If he thinks it was done already before, it means he has to go to the library and uh, find that reference. He can't just write, ah, this was done before. It, it, he doesn't have any credibility if he says that. And um, a sad truth is that most reviewers are just too lazy to do that. So even if your work wasn't, uh, if you have a good gap sentence, it might just slide by. Now, usually in a paper, this is one sentence long. It may be a few sentences in a thesis. It must be negative. It has to have a word in there like no, not, nobody, never, etc. It must relate to the previous papers by you and your group in the same manner as all the other papers. By that, I mean, there has to be a gap right now at this instant when you are submitting this paper, not when you began your work three years ago and you've already published three papers. You have to be stating what was not done by anybody else, nor by you in those other three papers that justify writing this paper. The sentence should be explicit, precise, and focused. Here's an example. The dependence of the interface structure between titanium substrates and aluminum films on the substrate bias voltage has not yet been determined. Emphasis here on the negative word, not. You don't want this sentence to be wishy-washy. By wishy-washy, I mean, when you go to the shoot to buy a cucumber, you want a cucumber that is crisp. You go like this to break it and you hear a snap, okay? You wouldn't buy a cucumber if you got to bend it, it kind of just bends and hangs there. You want your gap sentence to be like that crisp cucumber. You don't want to say few research have investigated. 
that basically says there is no gap. Someone has already investigated this. Okay, that's not a gap sentence at all. In fact, those few researches should have been the focus of the literature review and the gap should be written relative to them. Nor do you want to begin the sentence with, to the best of our knowledge. This is a waste of exactly six words. It's your job to know the literature. And the fact that you have written these six words will not give you a pass if in fact it has been done before. There's no benefit to it all. All it does is erase doubts in the uh, eyes and ears of your reviewers and readers. Okay, the gap sentence is immediately followed by the statement of purpose. In other words, the objective. It states explicitly and clearly the objective, which will always be to fill the previously stated gap and by the way, to answer the research question. It should be concise, precise, explicit, and focused. And by reading your statement of purpose, the research question should be implicitly clear. Here's an example. The objective of this research was to determine the dependence of the aluminum titanium interface as a function of substrate voltage during vacuum arc deposition. Now, someone who has read this statement of purpose knows that the gap was that no one has done this before. He furthermore knows that the research question is, um, how does the aluminum titanium interface uh, depend on the substrate voltage during vacuum arc deposition? You can do, if you will, something akin to a Fourier transform, which goes between the frequency domain to the time domain. You can do a Boxman transform and go from the research question to the statement of purpose, from the statement of purpose uh, to the uh, gap sentence, or in any order that you want. It contains all of the same elements, just in a different word order, maybe with a different uh, uh, verb or something like that to make it from a question into a statement. Now, the statement, the objective of the research is never to do research. Therefore, don't use words that mean the same thing as do research, like study or investigate. Instead, use more wor words that have more tachlis to them that are decisive, like measure, determine, construct, calculate, even understand. Now, there are two ways to write the statement of purpose. Usually in physics and engineering, we'll make the uh, statement of purpose centered on the research. And then we write it in the past tense, something like the objective of the research or project, investigation, et cetera, et cetera, was, in the past tense, and then indeed give the, the objective. Alternatively, it can be centered on the paper. This is frequently done in mathematics, in which case we use the present tense. The objective of this paper or report or article, et cetera, et cetera, is. Either is okay. Uh, for IVS members, usually this will be the form that is preferred. Now, just a word about the optional parts. Statements of value. These indicate the importance or significance of the work and motivate the reader to continue reading. They should be short, one or two sentences, and generally speaking, modest. Okay, not every work on nano uh, technology is going to be a cure for cancer. Finally, the preview, again, it's optional. It's useful if you have a long paper, like a thesis maybe, uh, and if you have a paper that is not following the standard format. 
There are two kinds of previews. One is giving the principal result right up front, right here in the introduction. Remember, we're not writing a murder mystery. If we give, if we give the principal result right up front, uh, the reader kind of tunes his uh, antenna in the right direction to see how you got there. The other kind of preview is indicating the organization. And this is a very good idea if you're using something that's a non-standard organization. Like you may have had two very, very different experiments that you did. And, and when you write your thesis, you'll have one chapter that describes one experiment. It'll start with the methodology of that experiment and then the results of that experiment. And then there'll be another chapter that gives the other experiment and then you tie it all together in, in a discussion. Alerting the reader of this up front helps him, again, keep on track as he reads. Okay, up to here. Um, up to here, the uh, uh, introduction. I will begin the methodology section. I don't know that I'll finish it today uh, because I want to leave about 10 minutes for questions. And I remind everyone. Same time next week, uh, I will continue and complete this tutorial. The methodology section could be called different names depending upon uh, your field and whether it's an experimental or a um, theoretical paper. It might be called experimental apparatus and procedures. In chemistry, it might be called methods and materials. I just have one request, don't call it experimental. Experimental is an adjective and the title must include a noun. You could call it experimental details if you wish. In a theoretical paper, which I'll talk about separately, uh, we were answering the same question of what did I do in sections that might be called development of the uh, theoretical model or uh, 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 development of the model equations, etc. Now, a question that is frequently asked is how much detail do I have to give? And there's an absolute answer. You absolutely must include sufficient detail so that every result that is presented can be duplicated elsewhere. Now, I'm not talking about being duplicated by your plumber or your electrician or by your carrot bite or a non-professional, but by a first year master's degree student. That should be the level that you're aiming at. This means that if you have some secrets that you don't want to divulge, but you need to use those secrets to get your results, don't publish a paper. Keep your secret. It's also nice to report details which would help your readers. On the other hand, you want to eliminate extraneous details, things that everyone knows. O-rings and nuts and bolts, don't need it. Now, in experimental papers, we're usually talking about uh, experimental apparatus and experimental procedure. We start with the apparatus. We make a differentiation between standard or well-known apparatus, which it's sufficient to mention or define and giving it a reference as appropriate, or Non-standard equipment. Here we have to describe it. We describe it by defining its purpose, giving a brief overall description, probably using a diagram, describing its parts in some logical order, either following the signal or the material flow or geometrical, left to right, top to bottom, etc. And then how does the whole thing work together? How do these parts operate together in order to perform the purpose of the apparatus. If you have a diagram, it should be schematic. It should only show the parts necessary to understand operation. This means never use a workshop diagram. They're too detailed and the lines are too thin. Likewise, don't use a photograph. Schematic diagram. All the parts mentioned in the text should be labeled in the diagram. And all unusual parts in the diagram should be described in the text. Here's an example of a good diagram using what I call heads-up display. All the parts 
are labeled with words. If there's not enough room for words, then abbreviations that are easy to guess at. Here is what you don't want to do. If you do it like this, the reader six times has to dart his eyes back and forth between the diagram and wherever these numbers are explained. This is what you do in a thesis application. Kindly, don't do it in a paper. Okay, I think I want to stop now and open up uh, this tutorial to questions. Uh, feel free to ask anything. And uh, I will conclude uh, this presentation next week at the same time. Okay, floor is open. Kindly, if you ask a question, uh, turn on uh, your uh, picture and uh, uh, be sure to unmute. And uh, if we can't hear you, raise your hand and uh, Sydney will make sure he unmutes. So, um, because there are so many people, uh, we'll try just having people send it by the chat and then I'll read it out. Otherwise, we might have a cacophony of uh, 10 people talking at once. If it doesn't work, okay. we'll, yeah. That's fine, we'll then. Try that. So, uh, go ahead and, and use the chat to send a message, and Ray, you can read the chat and uh, uh, answer. Okay. I see that there's already a lot of stuff here in the chat. So, let me try to start from the the things there are not yet questions. They're, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Here's a quick one while people put things in. Is there a convention uh, when you said you should also always mention the name of the author when you, uh, instead of just the reference number, whether you use the first author or whoever the, you know, the corresponding or lead um, author is on that paper? Yes, there is. The first author. Well, first of all, if it's only two offers, I'd mention both of them. If it's a three or more, uh, just the first author. And uh, that's the convention. The first author is supposed to be the guy who did most of the work. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, I see you got a question here. Yeah, okay, uh, where to put the uh, gap sentence? Well, um, if you use the standard organization that I, I'm suggesting, and you have an introduction, and parts of the introduction are everything that I've just mentioned, then it goes exactly where I, I've mentioned, okay? the the um, You start with an overall general background, you give the uh, literature review, and then you give the gap sentence, and then you give the research objectives. If you are forced to put the research objectives as a separate section, uh, because that is what your thesis advisor or your graduate committee has dictated, then the um, uh, gap step sentence should be the last sentence of your literature review. In other words, you want to summarize the, uh, um, the, the literature review and the last sentence of that summary ought to be what wasn't done. Okay, what about tense? Uh, it depends where. Mostly, you should use the simple past tense. There are a few exceptions. Um, when you present results, we'll talk about it uh, next week. Uh, there are three types of sentences that you use uh, called a location, presentation, and comment. The location sentence, which basically says what data is and what figure, is written in the present tense. Almost everything else goes into the simple past tense. Okay, four new messages. Let's see here. How do you decide? Uh, the person who asked about tense also asked, does it depend upon journal? Yes, it does. There are a very few journals that like things to be in the present tense. I think that this is incorrect. 
uh, it sounds to me awkward, uh, but if you have a journal that demands it, then you do what they say, of course. Now, how do you decide which details belong in supplemental material rather than in the body of the paper? Uh, in my case, I worry that including all the important details for uh, reproducing results may hurt the focus and flow of the paper. Um, you can put um, some details in what is called an appendix. But I think that everything that is essential for, really essential for reproducing the results should be in the paper itself. Supplemental results, supplemental details should be things that are not absolutely essential. For example, you might be able to accomplish the same purpose using more than one computer code. You want to give the code because uh, it will be helpful to uh, a new researcher, for example. That could go in supplemental uh, details. Uh, if you summarize the code, in other words, the principles by which the code is written uh, in uh, your uh, methodology section, that should be sufficient. Someone who is skilled in uh, the art should be able to write a code based on uh, the principles that you outline. Questions about excluding outliers. In biology versus physics, the tendency is not to report uh, all the repetitions used to observe a trend, but the best set where one can get good significance. Hmm. How to treat three to five sigma outliers in various fields, physics and biology. My, well, I don't know. First of all, I have to state that in my, my particular niche, it's almost like biology. I deal with arcs and sparks and they're very irreproducible. Uh, we, we get a lot of scatter. Uh, I think it's proper to report all of that scatter. Uh, in order to pull out of that scatter a trend, I will follow some kind of procedure and I will report what that procedure is. And I think that generally in materials and, and in physics in any event, that's the case. In biology, I don't know. I think you, you, you have to be honest and not throw away stuff just because you thought it was a bad day for your bacteria. There has to be a good reason why you throw it out. Uh, otherwise, I have the feeling that you are very likely uh, not only fooling your readers, but you're fooling yourself. Okay, is it good to give the gap sentence or the title in a question form. I would suggest not using the question form, neither the gap sentence nor the title. Uh, I, I think it, it, it comes out better and it's more standard uh, to uh, present everything in your paper as ordinary declarative sentences. How do you decide which equations can be in line and which should get their own line? Uh, that's a good question and it's not something that I've really dealt with. I would suggest the following. Uh, only very simple stuff, stuff that is very short and very simple and readily understandable should be in line. It's better to set equations off separately. It's easier for the reader to follow and to find them later when he wants to try to reproduce your results. There are some medical journals that allow short communications type of submissions, uh, under 2000 words. Uh, how should the introduction be formulated? What part of the introduction do you recommend that should be reduced. Well, first of all, uh, let me state very, very clearly that what I'm talking about right now is about the full research report. The full research report is a full, if you will, disclosure of what you did and how it allows reproducibility. You don't have that 
demand in a short communications. Um, and uh, therefore, where you skip is uh, you abbreviate the uh, literature review, only give maybe cite the two or three most relevant papers. And I think you can also um, not be so complete in the uh, methodology section. You don't expect someone to uh, reproduce your result from what you've written in a short communications. It is your responsibility, however, to follow up at some point and to fully report your uh, methodology in a full paper later. What are some ways to convey uh, the value and importance of your results and your approach? Well, one way we've already discussed, namely to give a uh, value uh, statement in the introduction. The other is in the discussion. And we'll talk about that in uh, detail uh, next week. When is it appropriate to add a future work segment to a paper? I don't think it's uh, appropriate at all. A, a paper reports on what you've done. Um, now, you can indicate the need for further work in your discussion. Uh, that, that, that is appropriate to say, we, we've answered this question, but now it's opened up another question that is certainly part of, of a discussion and uh, it can be there. Furthermore, the conclusions uh, might be called recommendations and conclusions. And a recommendation might be for uh, future follow-up work. Now, in so doing, uh, you are basically inviting any of your readers to do that work. You may be indicating that you plan to do that, but nonetheless, uh, don't be surprised if someone picks up the gauntlet that you have thrown down and uh, does exactly what you would like to do in your next paper. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Now, there's your last chance. If not, uh, I will shut up, send the meeting back to Sydney, and uh, invite you all to come uh, next week for uh, the second part of this tutorial. Okay. In the name of all of us, thank you very much for this very informative uh, lesson. And remember, everyone, next week, same time, same channel, uh, for the second uh, half of this talk. So I'll go ahead and just make this time a very brief introduction. I presume that most people that are here were present last time. And if you're back, that means you must have liked it. Uh, what I think uh, this time is Ray is going to build on some of the principles that were brought forth in the last lecture and expand on them and talk specifically about uh, writing a good paper and focusing on, on a thesis, which is probably relevant to a lot of you uh, very directly in the, some probably in the very near future. I would also uh, like to remind everyone that recording of this talk, the previous talk, all of the IVS webinars are available on the IVS website. Chaim has made a very nice archive there. You can look at any of them anytime you want. It's absolutely free. Uh, and um, uh, again, to remind people that uh, we will uh, be open for some questions at the end of this, we will leave time. Uh, you can post questions over chat and they will all be addressed, uh, hopefully to your satisfaction. So uh, we're looking forward to the second half. Thank you, Ray, let's go ahead. Okay. Oh, oh, and one more thing, uh, this, there are two parallel series of webinars. One is scientific uh, uh, talks, which are given by scientists, really top scientists from all over the world. And the other is the skills which researchers need. And we have a lot of exciting topics coming up um, on, for instance, use of mathematics, uh, we've been talking about uncertainty, uh, a talk from the CEO of Yeda, which is the commercialization wing of the Weizmann. So uh, please stay tuned uh, for further talks on this parallel series of webinars. So, sorry, go ahead. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sydney and uh, Chaim. Thanks a lot for uh, facilitating the uh, technical aspects. Uh, this is part two of a talk that I started last week. So I'd like to uh, very quickly review uh, what we did uh, last week. First of all, before you begin to write, uh, text, my mistake here, you want to define for yourself your research question. When you write a paper, you're writing a paper in order to answer a research question. Write down for yourself what that research question is before you begin to write text. Also, make a detailed outline down to the level of one line for each paragraph of the entire paper. Now you write this detailed outline with bits and bytes. You don't use a chisel and put it in granite. So you can change it. But when you do change it, you do it with thought uh, because you reach the realization that uh, uh, it could be done a little bit, organized a little bit differently and better than what you did previously. So you don't, you can, don't be afraid to make changes, but uh, start with a well-defined outline. Uh, we talked about the introduction. It has four compulsory parts. The first is a general background that should be understandable by all the readers that you anticipate. That means all the readers will be reading that journal and all of the um, students that will follow in your wake uh, and the possible uh, uh, evaluators of your thesis. Uh, this is followed by a literature review. Basically, it's a collection of citations of uh, various previous work, which you may order by chronology, by relevance or approach, according to what seems to fit best for your paper. The next part is the gap. Here you state explicitly what was not done. And this is followed by the statement of purpose or the objective. And a good way to begin this, par this sentence is the objective of our project or research was, and then here put the objective. Uh, we started to talk about the methodology the most important rule is to give sufficient detail to allow duplication of each and every result that you will present. Uh, this uh, methodology section usually includes apparatus and procedures. In the apparatus part, you want to identify standard equipment. In other words, either give it a name, uh, cite the manufacturer and the um, model number, or give a, uh, the important specification uh, that will allow someone to uh, repeat your experiment. For example, we used an oscilloscope that had a band pass of uh, five megahertz or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, you have to describe custom equipment. We talked about how to describe it. It'll probably include a diagram. If you have a diagram, you should use heads up labeling and consistent nomenclature. In other words, the labels you use in the diagram should be identical to what's used in the text. And this is followed by procedure, which we'll, we'll describe in just another minute or two. I just want to reflash the last two uh, slides that I showed. This is a good uh, di diagram of equipment. Everything is labeled with words. This is what you don't want to do. This is okay for a thesis, um, excuse me, a patent application but it's not the way to write a paper. Um, a few words about, uh, now moving on. Um, a few words about style and grammar. Generally speaking, past tense. The voice can be either uh, active or passive, but if it's a human agent, you want to avoid the active. Don't use I or we. It's uh, rep repetitive. It's egotistical, and most important, is putting the emphasis on the scientist rather than the science. Um, articles. Articles means a, an, and the. Uh, for Hebrew speakers, this is not too much of a problem because in uh, Hebrew we have a hayidia, and the rules are pretty much similar to English. If your native language happens to be Russian or Chinese, this is more of a problem. 
because there's about a dozen different rules about when you use which article in English. But I'll give you one rule, which works about 75% of the time in scientific writing. The first time you mention a component or part, for example, in the description of uh, your apparatus, introduce it with the article a or and as appropriate. But then every subsequent mention, it should be preceded by the. You want to start with old information and then give new information. For example, ions were produced with a Kaufman source. The source was positioned 25 centimeters from the substrate surface. Um, here, by putting source in the beginning, it's indicating that this is old information. Also is preceded by the. And now finally, uh, experimental procedure. This is the sequence of events that you follow in conducting the experiment. You need to give sufficient detail to duplicate results, but not give unnecessary details. You have to specify all experimental conditions or parameters that are required to duplicate the results. It depends on what kind of experiment you're doing, but it may include pressure, temperature, voltage, fields, flows, etc. Now you want to give um, right here in the experimental details uh, section the values of things which are fixed throughout the paper. But you want to mention also what your experimental variables are and give the range of them. A good way of doing this is by summarizing all these parameters in the form of a table at the end of the methodology section. First, you give the fixed parameters together with their values. And then you give the experimental parameters, the experimental var variables, and you give either the range or the discrete uh, specific choices that you used. Now, once you've done this, when you get to the results section, which will follow in just another slide or two, you never have to mention these values ever again. The reader already knows about them. But use this table when you proofread your paper to make sure that for every result, the reader knows all of these, the value of all of these um, variables every time you give a result. Now in theoretical papers, uh, this methodology section will often be called things like model assumptions or derivation of equations. They also answer the basic question, what did I do? Here you want in a theoretical paper or a model uh, simulation or whatever, you want to state all your assumptions first and then develop the specific equations that you will solve. Again, here you must give sufficient detail for duplication. Now, by sufficient detail, I mean for a first year graduate student, not for Einstein, okay? The level of your paper should be pitched at a first year graduate student. A first year graduate student should not need to work weeks or months to go from equation three to equation four. You should be able to do it in seconds or minutes. Um, one of the biggest problems that I see in theoretical papers is poor use of nomenclature and symbols. You want to define each symbol, either the first time it's used or in some kind of symbol or nomenclature table. You want to make sure that every symbol is defined and that it's used consistently. I suggest that you make a table for your own use that has four columns. First column is the symbol itself. The second column is the definition. You can use these first two columns for a nomenclature table if you choose to use it to publish it. But you should also include for your own use all of the pages in which the symbol appears and the page which contains the definition. Okay? Uh, clearly, this should be the first of the values that are stated here. And you use this when you proofread your paper to make sure that you've used your symbols consistently and that they're all defined. Okay, moving on.
We said what we did. Now we have to say what we got. And that's the results section. It answers the basic question. What did I get? And or what did I observe? Now, in our fields, typically most of the results are actually given in tables and figures. And we design the text to go around the table or figure. Um, that stated, I'm going to say it again. We have to take a lot of effort to design the figure and the table. Okay, that's part of the mission. It isn't just using words. It's using these figures and tables effectively. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. The text basically describes the figure or the table. And we use three kinds of sentences. The first is called a location sentence. And it indicates what information is in which particular table or figure. The second is a presentation sentence or maybe several sentences where we actually present the most important results. We actually say what you can physically see in the figure or table, not what we interpret, but what we see. It should be written so that if a blind person is being read the paper, he could actually visualize exactly what's on that figure or table. And these are followed by comments. The comments might be uh, explanations, they may be comparisons, they may be extrapolations. Now, you may combine the L and P into a single sentence, but you should never combine the comment material with anything else. These two, L and P, are factual. Comments often involve opinion or interpretation or judgment. And we have to use a different kind of language and geographical separation between that and what we would call repeatable facts. Here's a few examples. Here's a location sentence. The correlation parameters is a function of distance from the jet outlet. Uh, should be R shown in figure three. Present tense. Here's a presentation sentence. It may be seen that the correlation decreased steeply with distance and became negligible after five centimeters. Now this is a good presentation sentence. I could draw this graph from this explanation. And that's what you want. Another criteria for a good presentation sentence is that the reader, whether we can see or cannot see, could take those presentation sentences and actually sketch the figure himself. If you can do that, it's a good presentation sentence or sentences, and if not, it's inadequate. Do it better. And then here's a comment. The re this result, uh, differs significantly from those observed with conventional jets. Here's a, an example of a combined LMP sentence. The wavelet intensity has a Gaussian temporal profile whose width decreases with distance between sources as may be seen in figure four. Okay, the location sentence could be either be active or passive. Generally, we use the present tense. The presentation sentence summarizes the most important results of tables and figures, and remember the blind man's rule. It presents what can actually be seen in the figure, not your interpretation of it, but what's actually there. Your interpretation of it goes later in a comment sentence. Use the past tense and be precise and as quantitative as is necessary and possible. Look at these four sentences. It may be seen that Y depended on X. Practically no information there. If Y didn't depend on X, you probably would not be presenting the figure. It's basically, basically a waste of words. On the other hand, the second one conveys a lot more information. It may be seen that Y increased with X. Already you can visualize this. 
we can even be more exact. It may be seen that Y increased linearly with X. Okay, finally, the shortest sentence of all is the most uh, precise. It may be seen that Y was approximately equal to 22.3 X plus 32. Now, I wouldn't burden the reader of this information unless it was important. My point in giving these four sentences is that with very little extra space, we can be often more precise. Um, the common sentences is for interpretations, explanations, comparisons, etc. Uh, you should only give an immediate comment sentence if it's related to the specific figure that you're looking at right now. If it re relies on more than one figure, and it isn't crucial to give the reader this comment right now, wait. Put it in the discussion section of the paper. Do not write a paper that has a combined results and discussion section. Um, at least 50% of the papers that I read that have such a section, they're terrible. Uh, it doesn't appear that the uh, writer understands the difference between a result and an interpretation. Now, it's very critical that all of the conditions are given to get a particular result. If the condition wasn't already presented, uh, for example, in that table at the end of the methodology section, then you must give it together with the figure, either in the location sentence or in the caption or heads up right in the figure. Like you could put on the figure just a line P equals three atmospheres, for example. Make sure you always give the conditions first and then the result. You don't give a result and then say, and by the way, this happened when uh, the relative humidity was 22%. Okay, you say, when the humidity was 22%, we obtained such and such. Now, designing how to present your information in the form of a table or a graph is very, very important. It's crucial. It's part of the skill that you need to have. First question is, for numerical data, uh, information, when do we use a table and when do we use a graph? You should use a table when the absolute value is the most important aspect of the information. For example, you have measured the mass of an electron to two or three more significant figures than was ever done before. Well, you can't present that in a graph. You can in a table. On the other hand, you should use a graph where the trend or a comparison is the most important uh, aspects of the information. If the trend is what's important, then you want a line graph. If a comparison between various cases is what's most important, then you want a bar graph. If you are using the line graph, you want to choose the x-axis so that it, and not some parameter, represents the most important variable. In other words, the most important aspect of your data should be presented as y as a function of x. Now, uh, one of uh, the diseases, I think we, we as, a, as a community suffer frequently from two diseases. They're almost a pandemic. Disease number one is what I would call instrumentitis. We all like our favorite instruments. If you're an electrical engineer, you love your oscilloscope. If you are a materials engineer, you love your uh, X-ray diffraction. And each of these machines spits out to you information in a particular format. 
that might not be the information that tells your scientific story. If you're an electrical engineer, you may have measured, um, I don't know, different curves of uh, voltage as a function of time, because that's what an oscilloscope does. And you do it for five different uh, uh, temperatures. And that's really the information that you want, because all of these V is a function of T, they're all the same. They you had a sinus input, you got a sinus output. You don't need to see five sine waves. It's absolutely ridiculous. What you need is uh, maybe the peak voltage as a function of temperature. Your oscilloscope doesn't present that. You have to do some work. What might be important is um, uh, the um, fraction of some um, uh, phase as a function of some parameter. That requires a line graph. You don't get that from the XRD spectrum. Presenting five XRD spectra simply makes more work for the reader and signifies that the writer was lazy or doesn't understand how to present his information. Uh, use a heads up display if possible. In other words, give all the information that's needed right on the graph. In other words, don't automatically suffer from the second disease that many of us have, which I call Excel-itis. We tend to use the uh, default options in Excel to present our data. And Excel would love to have you use a legend. Don't. Label each curve, if possible, directly, because it's quicker for the reader. It doesn't have to look for the explanation. Oy, this is a triangle. Now I have to find the caption uh, or the legend, which might be right up there or might be in the caption. And then you have to go and do this five times. On the other end, it's just right, right on the curve. This is P equals one atmosphere. P equals two atmosphere. Bang, it's right there. Uh, all graphs, you have to label the axes and give the units. Don't use times 1000 or things like that ever. Either write out the unit completely or use the standard abbreviation, millivolts, meg megavolts, or whatever. Uh, this will be interpreted by 50% of your readers exactly the wrong way. Okay, next is the, the discussion. Up to here, up to now, we've told what we did and what we got. Basically, we've given the reader a lot of information. We've thrown at him a lot of data. The discussion is where we convert that information into knowledge. And this requires a certain degree of judgment and I would say this is the most difficult part of the paper to write, particularly for a novice writer. It answers the question, so what? Okay, I have this whole pile of data. Voltage is a function of time and temperature under uh, 15 different scenarios. Here is where I tell the reader, what does it all mean? Now there are typical elements in the discussion. Some is a specific reference to the present study. For example, we may refer to the main purpose or hypothesis, just to remind the reader, you know, what are we doing here? We may review the most important findings. Again, just to remind uh, the reader where to focus his attention on of all of the hundreds of results we may have already given. And here's a place also to uh, present limitations and justifications. By justifications, I mean, for example, in a model paper, a theoretical paper, a demonstration of self-consistency. We may have assumed that uh, all of uh, the velocities were subsonic. And I run my... Uh, uh, simulation, and I get the results of these velocities, 
And I look at them and say, hey, they're all subsonic. So that indicates that at least the, uh, uh, the model was self-consistent, doesn't prove that it's right, but uh, at least it's hopeful. Uh, in the experiments that I do in arcs and sparks, we get a lot of scatter. It's just the nature of the beast. If you're in biology, you get a lot of scatter. Not every uh, string bean seed is the same as the next string bean seed. So in coming up with uh, graphs that you know make some kind of curve through a whole bunch of scattered uh, points, we may need to uh, do some kind of statistical analysis and justify the validity of these trends that we're trying to extract from the data. This is a place to do it. But also we may have limitations. If you're using an oscilloscope, there's a maximum bandwidth. If it's 100 megahertz, I'm not going to be able to see time features of 0.1 nanosecond. If I have a, an optical microscope that has about one micron resolution, I'm not going to see 10 uh, nanometer features. Here is the place to point that out. Moving on, we would, we would like to compare uh, our results. We may have different, re different results that we've presented, different diagnostics that speak to the same question. Uh, maybe we did an experimental analysis and maybe we did an, uh, a uh, theoretical analysis. Here's where we compare it. Likewise, we may want to compare our results with previous results. If we did an experiment, we may want to compare it to past experiments and also to uh, theoretical predictions and vice versa. And this is the place for making more general statements. These include, in particular, explanations, as well as implications and generalizations. And finally, recommendations, either for future research or for some kind of practical application. In general, the discussion starts with specific statements relevant to the present study, and it diverges towards more general statements. Remember the uh, trapezoid that I showed in the first lecture. This is the part where the trapezoid flares outward from the specific to the general. Now, a major problem that I see in a lot of writing is correctly conveying the degree of certainty, or if you will, uncertainty of, for example, explanations and implications. There should be no uncertainty at all, zero uncertainty about a result. That's why we present results in a separate session called results, okay? There, every person in the world who follows the recipe that you gave in the methodology will get within the experimental error the same results that you got. But once you get to the discussion where we're using some degree of interpretation and uh, judgment, then we have a certain degree of uncertainty. And what distinguishes a mature scientist from an immature scientist is the ability to deal with this uncertainty. Now, uh, where this degree of uncertainty is not correctly uh, presented, it's often because of faulty or absent analysis by the author. Okay, he simply didn't understand what the hell he's doing. Doesn't understand the difference between interpretation and fact. Or it could simply be the wrong choice of words. It's perfectly okay to offer a speculative explanation because you as, a, for example, an experimenter are probably in a better position to guess at what's really happening than anybody else in the world. But if it is a speculation, you should make it clear to the reader that it's a speculation and keep it short. I would like to propose what we might call Boxman scale of certainty or uncertainty. Uh, 
as a way to keep yourself on track here. The lowest level on the scale is what I would call a speculation. It's an idea or ideas that come to your mind, but you don't have an awful lot uh, to base it on. And on that case, we use words like may, possible, or conceivably. The next level up is that there's some specific evidence that supports this idea. And then we may use words like suggest or indicate. The next level up, which I call very likely, is when there's substantial evidence that supports this idea. Several results point in the same direction. And then I might use words like is consistent or strongly suggest. And usually the highest level that we get to is what I would call most likely. This is where there is more evidence or theoretical support for some particular idea than any other existing idea. And I probably use a word like most likely. Now the highest possible level on this scale is what I would call proven or proof. But frankly, this occurs very rare in physics and engineering. It's something that mostly happens in mathematics and mathematical like sciences where um, you can offer a mathematical proof for a statement. This is when in physics anyway, we have all possible explanations on the table and a decisive test indicates that this idea and only this idea explains the observation. So for example, uh, the idea that the speed of light was universal was proven, if you will, uh, in the um, uh, Michelson-Morley experiment. Uh, the reason that it could be proven in the Michelson-Morley experiment was that there were only two choices. There were two explanations uh, on the table. Either light depended on medium or light did not depend on the medium. So by doing a decisive test, you could show that it didn't depend on the medium. But that's rare. Maybe two or three papers per hundred years these days will come up to the level of proof unless it's something that's very mathematical. Now, in the discussion, we don't introduce new results. Uh, we're, sometimes you find papers that this happens and it's terrible when it happens. It's when someone writes a paper in, this, in the uh, style of Johnny wandering around in the land of wonderment and science. And so Johnny says what he, did an experiment number one, and then he did an experiment number two, and then he starts giving the explanation, and then bang, the idea comes upon his mind that the key to understanding what's happening is experiment number three. He goes back to the laboratory, does it, and he puts experiment number three in the discussion. It doesn't belong there. It belongs in the results. Okay? If he had written a good outline, he wouldn't be doing that. So all the results are presented in the results. Here we merely discuss the results. Finally, we come to conclusions. This can be the concluding paragraph of the discussion, but it's better to have a separate section entitled conclusions or maybe conclusions and recommendations. It should be short. In a, a journal paper, maybe one, maybe two paragraphs. The, the conclusions is not a summary of the paper. The summary of the paper is the abstract. You only put in the conclusions the bottom line. What you found, what does it all mean? What is the answer to the research question? You don't repeat the objectives or the methodology. They don't belong in the conclusions. You don't use any what are called indicative sentences. An indicative sentence merely indicates what you did. For example, remember, read, you don't do. 
The micro hardness and critical load were measured as functions of the substrate temperature. A sentence like this does not belong in the conclusions. And for sure, no new information, no new results. Everything in the conclusions is based on results that you presented in the results section, and you've already discussed and analyzed in the discussion section. Here, you merely summarize the most important results and their implications. You should think of three things you want the re reader to remember, where one of them always is the answer to the research question. Now, the conclusion should be self-contained. It should not have any references, neither internal, like see figure three, or external, where you're citing a reference. If you have recommendations, they must be firmly based on the present work. Okay, uh, we've gone through all of the paper. Now I wanna talk about the things that belong at the beginning of the paper, in particular the abstract. I think it's a good idea to write a draft of the abstract before you write the body of the paper, but you must always rewrite it after you're done. Often we don't really know what we've done until we've written it down. Um, the process of writing is also a process of thinking. So after we've gone through all of the procedure of writing our paper and polishing it, and maybe we've gone through it a couple of times, then we should look at the abstract again and rewrite it as necessary. It should summarize in one or two sentences each the background, the objective, the methodology, the most important results, and the conclusions. Now, this is a summary. This is a summary of the entire paper. Now, note, the abstract is not the introduction of the paper. We have an introduction to the paper that introduces the paper. Uh, one of the mistakes that I see is people who write an abstract where 50 or 60% of the abstract is the background. Shouldn't be that way. The background should be no more than one or two sentences, better one sentence. The emphasis here should be on the results and the conclusions. Here is where you use the two sentences. Here is where you use the one sentence. Now, many more people will read your abstract and will read the whole paper. Therefore, almost all journals today require an informative abstract. Uh, again, an indicative example is the voltage as a function of temperature was measured. You may have an indicative sentence in the abstract, but the abstract must contain informative examples like it was found that the voltage decreased as a function of temperature and reached a saturation value of 30 millivolts. In other words, you actually give the most important results. You don't just say, hey, I got some results. You actually give the most important of the results in um, the abstract. The abstract should stand alone. No references. I suggest that you don't use any abbreviations in the abstract. If you use an abbreviation, uh, an abbreviation, you must define it in the abstract. And you should only use it if you're going to be using that abbreviation many times within the abstract uh, itself. And by using that abbreviation, you're going to save considerable space because you must define each and every abbreviation the first time that you use it. And of course, in front of everything, we have the title. That's a good idea to propose for yourself a tentative title along with the detailed outline at the beginning of the writing process. But just like you should go back and review the uh, abstract, you ought to reevaluate and correct the title after the paper is written. It should be short, 
two no more than two lines. One is better. And it should accurately express the subject of the new results presented. And in the abstract, it should not contain any abbreviations except for chemical symbols. <coughs> no XRD, no SEM, okay? None of that stuff. It should all be written out if you need to put it in the title itself. So let me just check the time. Hey, right where we should be. I'd like to summarize this tutorial with uh, Esther Hadi Brot, 10 Commandments for Writing a Good Paper. The first is to start off before you begin writing anything with a well-defined research question. It's not part of the paper in our fields, but it should be implicit in the statement statement of purpose in the introduction. And it must be answered explicitly in the conclusions. You should organize the manner in, uh, excuse me, organize the paper in the standard manner. In other words, with introduction, methodology, results, discussion, and conclusions. You want to make sure that every statement is in the right place. And the way to do that is to prepare an outline before you start writing text. Third, make sure you have an explicit gap sentence in your, inter in your introduction. It should state what was not done previously. There should be nothing implicit here. It should be very explicit. It must have a negative word. And it shouldn't be wishy-washy. No business like few research uh, have uh, done this or to the best of my knowledge. None of that kind of nonsense. You must give all the details required for duplicating the results in the methodology section. The Body text in the results section is written around the various figures and tables that actually present most of your results. And every time you present one of these uh, figures or tables, you should first indicate the location, in other words, what's in the figure, then present what you actually see in the figure, and then if need be, comment on it. Uh, explain what this means, uh, compare it, uh, explain it. Very important that you prepare good graphics. Your, your graphs and figures should tell the scientific story that you're trying to tell. You have to design, design the figures so that they tell the story. Likewise, they should be easy to read and understand. You should use heads up display, for example. When you give explanations and implications, in other words, things which rely on judgment and opinion, you should be modest. Use words like may or might, possibly. When you write your first draft, in my opinion, you want to write very quickly. Get the words out of your brain and onto the paper in the minimum amount of time. But then you want to go back and polish each sentence. Ask yourself, can I make this statement clearer, better, or shorter? Basically, you want to eliminate every word that you can from every sentence. The idea is not that the paper should be shorter in order to save space in the journal, but because terse scientific writing is easier to read. Make sure your abstract is informative. You actually give results, the most important results, or sample results in the abstract. You don't just say, I measured the voltage. You say the voltage was, 22.7 millivolts. 
And finally, and this is really the key, you need to work hard to make the reader's job easy. Now, in an hour and a half of net time, I couldn't possibly tell you everything that one could possibly tell you in order to write a good paper. I've just given you highlights. If you want more, first of all, check out whether your university offers a scientific writing class. I know we have it in the Faculty of Engineering at Tel Aviv University. I know explicitly of people who are teaching such courses at REL, at the Technion, uh, and at Mahon Weizmann. Uh, likely there are similar courses at the other universities. Check it out. Secondly, many universities have what are called a writing center. This is a plug for the writing center at Tel Aviv University, which is called the Academic Writing and Communication Center. There, there are people who can help you if you come to them with specific questions or problems. How do I express this, et cetera, et cetera. That's their job. Um, if your university doesn't have a full semester um, writing course, this is something that I do for money. Uh, pass on the idea to your dean. Finally, read the book. Uh, I, together with Edith Boxman, have written a text called Communicating Science, a Practical Guide for Engineers and Physical Scientists. Uh, it's inexpensive. We chose the publisher in order to keep the cost down. It's world scientific. And furthermore, you can get a 25% discount if you use this code, if you buy it directly from World Scientific, and it's also uh, available uh, on any of the uh, book selling websites like Amazon. That's it. I hope this has helped you, and uh, I'd be very glad to entertain any questions. Uh, you can write them uh, into the chat, uh, or you can uh, raise your hand and I'll uh, try to uh, answer them uh, verbally. Up to you. You've been uh, you had wonderful questions uh, last week. If you got any more, just shoot them over to me right now. Okay, uh, and Ray, it was all very clear. Okay, I see a question here from uh, uh, Ali Savaknin. Oh, Alec. Alec, you have to unmute to ask your question. Sydney, you have to enable yeah, just, unmuting. Just a minute, I will do that. Okay, it's been enabled. Okay. Ali Savakni, you had a question. You can unmute yourself now. Or maybe I misinterpreted uh, okay. a clap instead of a raised hand. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? So in, in the meantime, I, I have a, a question while people input theirs or prepare them. Um, you made a big point about how the results and discussion should be kept uh, separate. And as you know, there are some short communications and letters where they actually require that you combine these into one section. So you have some specific, um, um, specific recommendations for when that's the case. Yeah, um, this um, presentation was aimed specifically at a genre of writing called the research report. Um, the uh, full research report, you don't want to do that ever. Much of what I had to say does not apply to uh, various kinds of short communications where you have uh, vigorous um, uh, uh, space limitations, in which case, for example, you will need to abbreviate the literature review. You will probably need to abbreviate the methodology section and not, uh, uh, not uh, uh, give all of the details necessary to 
duplicate your results. And if there is a specific guidance to uh, combine uh, uh, results with discussion, then of course you'll have to follow their guidelines. I don't know of any uh, journal that specifies that for a full paper. And I strongly recommend against it. I know that a lot of people do it. Some people manage to do it well, um, but an awful lot don't. And the reason is not keeping clear what is a result and what is an interpretation. A statement like the voltage uh, increased with um, temperature because uh, the material behaved like a metal isn't it? The, everything up to, up to be, because was a result. Everyone would get it. But everything after because is an interpretation. It has to be presented differently. It has to be separated physically uh, from the result. Otherwise, you may not be clear about what is interpretation and what is uh, fact. And, and, and if you're not clear, neither will your reader. Okay. I see a question in the. Yeah, a question. Uh, I see a question in the chat. In what cases should an appendix be used? Uh, examples where I would want to use an appendix are a math example, or expand on background. Is this correct? Uh, I think that appendices can be used for a number of things. Um, in theoretical kinds of papers, it can be used to give detailed uh, derivation of equations and detailed proofs, depending on the kind of paper. So that in the body of the paper, you just give an outline of the proof or an outline of the derivation. And that makes the flow of the paper uh, better. And uh, frankly, probably 90% of the readers will trust you about the details and don't wanna be burdened with going through all of this, I guess in Hebrew we would say kashyavish, uh, in order to get to what's really important. Uh, in a, uh, say, simulation paper or uh, uh, experimental paper, you might want to, for example, give computer code in an appendix or possibly even in a uh, supplemental material, depending upon whether it was essential for getting your results or merely, merely nice to know. Those are the examples that come to mind. Now, if you do use an appendix, there's a couple of rules. The appendix should be like a self-contained unit. In other words, the first line in the appendix should basically state the um, uh, the purpose of the appendix. And the last line of the appendix should give the, the bottom line. Uh, what, what did you learn from all of the appendix? The, uh, where, the, where the appendix is referred to in uh, the text should indicate what the purpose of the appendix was and the bottom line, in other words, what, what do you learn from the appendix that you need to continue reading the paper? In other words, the idea of using uh, an appendix is so that the flow of the paper will be better and continuous and faster. So you shouldn't have to refer into the appendix in order to read the paper. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Okay, do we have any more questions? If not, then again, I'd like to thank, uh, oh wait, here comes, oh, just a thanks, okay. Uh, then, uh, yeah, well, someone asked to share the presentation. I've, I've sent the link, all the, all the YBS presentations will be placed on the website, so. Um, I can also please. send uh, the uh, slides if uh, uh, you'd like to have them on the web website. Ah, so send it to Chaim. And okay, can, I'll send it to Chaim. Okay, you have another awesome. question here. I use several models and want to present them separately. 
Should I divide the paper into three chapters and write methods and results for each one? It depends on you. Uh, you, you have to decide on, on a case like that, um, how does it flow together best? Um, what you always want to remember, however, is that first you say what you did and then what you got. And in a case like this, if you're not following the standard organization, this would be a case where presenting a preview uh, in the uh, introduction would be appropriate. A preview which indicates uh, what the organization of the paper is. Okay, I think we're at time, Cindy. Great. So thanks again, Ray. It's been really uh, very informative, I think, very useful. Um, thanks everyone for participating and we hope to see you at our upcoming uh, seminars that you will be getting notifications about. Thank you.